Thank uh, everyone for taking time to be here. Thank you for uh, accepting our invitation to cover the press conferences at the sidelines of the APEC events here in Bagak, Bagak Bataan. So for our uh, first press conference for this week, we have uh, Mr. Roger Van Den Brink of the World Bank. He is a lead economist. He will be sharing with us some of the highlights of this morning's discussion. Just for a backgrounder, this morning's discussion focused on the subject of transparency. And um, the rationale behind this, that topic is uh, the idea that uh, if uh, we promote transparency, we also promote uh, public scrutiny, which in turn um, prompts uh, government to uh, make use of uh, public funds more efficiently and prudently. So to talk more about uh, the discussions this morning, uh, may we ask uh, Mr. Roger to, uh, to, to give a brief, brief statement, and then we will open the floor to Q&A. Thank you very much. So this morning we discussed open data and open government. Open data is an idea driven by te te technology at, at the moment that allows basically governments to open up a lot of data that they previously only disclosed themselves to the public. And the way this data is being uh, released is in an open format. And with open we mean that if you are a user of those data, you can basically take it and import it into a spreadsheet or into any machine readable form. That allows you to basically analyze those data yourself. So you can make graphs from it, you can make tables from it. It gives you the power to interpret the data that the government is giving you. That's a very big difference between a system in which the government basically produces its graphs and its tables and its storylines, and then basically what you're confronted with is the story of the government. Now you can take the data itself manipulate it, do other things with it, and give it your own interpretation. That open data revolution is spreading across the world. So there's, there's a large amount of governments now who are doing this. And they're opening up many, many data sets to the rest of the world. The idea is that because these data are now out there, that this will make it easier for citizens to hold their governments accountable. If citizens, for instance, know what is budgeted and what is being spent, not only might they feel that now, okay, we know why we're paying taxes, because we know where the money is going, it's going to education, it's going to health care, yeah. but we also think that citizens then can comment and can say, hmm, I think the spending on such and such, maybe you should, you should uh, think about that again and spend more on so and so. So this whole idea is, is going around the world and at a very fast pace, governments are putting these data out on the web. And we talked this morning about the speed at which this is happening, but we also talked about, about issues like, okay, but once we have opened up all these data sets, then what? What does it take now for governments and citizens and service providers to really make sure that this increased transparency leads to better provision of services? And that's really at the heart of the matter. You know, in this country, the president likes to talk about the people are my bosses. And this is again, this is exactly the right way to look at it. You know, citizens have different mechanisms with which they can hold their governments accountable. The political one that you all know of is elections. So every so often, citizens can choose their political leaders, and those political leaders then take the helm of government, and they try and make government behave in such a way that it provides services to the people. But that accountability is only ever so often, four years, five years, six years, depending on the country. It's also very important for citizens to know how these services are being delivered in their area, in their neighborhood. So yes, it's important for citizens to know that the national budget is out there and they can look at it, but it's equally important for citizens, the bosses, to know 
what the budget of the local school is, or the local health clinic, or the Department of Public Works. So that there's a very direct accountability between citizens and government. When, when these systems work together, so the accountability between citizens and their political leaders, the accountability between the political leaders as heads of agencies and their internal service providers, and then from the service providers to the citizens, when these accountability relations work together well, that's when you have a modern government which is open, which is democratic, and which provides services to all of the people. Those are the things we discussed this morning. And there's various indexes that, that several organizations in the world use to sort of measure countries, how well they're doing on those various fronts. So not just in terms of releasing the data, which is very, very welcome, but all what are people making out of these data? Does this lead to better accountability? Does this lead to better government services? And as you can expect, in a community like APIC, there's, there's, there's many leaders, there's some laggards, yeah? But in general, we are all very surprised at the speed with which this movement is happening across the world today. So from maybe a few data sets being released three years ago, we now have hun literally hundreds and hundreds of data sets out there for the, for the public. So this is really, this can be a transformative uh, movement. And we heard from, from various speakers in various countries uh, uh, how they were doing. Let me end on that and ask you to ask me questions. Okay, so for those who want, who want to ask questions, you can uh, just raise your hand and then I will acknowledge you. You can proceed to the mic and then ask your question. Mention the name of your organization first. Who, uh, who wants to uh, take the floor first? Okay, sir. Uh, please, please state your name and the name of your organization. Thank you. I'm Shane Velasco from uh, Philippine Information Agency. Sir, um, the Aquino administration has already committed on the Open Government Partnership, which is, I understand, signed by various uh, countries. And in connection to that, did you think that this Open Government Partnership is in connection with this Open Data Initiative initiated by, by the APEC economies? Yeah, so it's the same thing, actually. So open government needs open data. Okay. So when we discussed this morning, we, we were talking about those two initiatives at, at the same time. All right. So my follow-up question on that is, the lower chamber of Congress has um, recently passed the establishment of the Department of Information and Communication Technology. In World Bank, what do you think is the impact of this on the passage of the Department of ICT? for this continuing uh, pursuing on this open data initiative by the uh, APEC economies in, their, in this recent meeting? So that initiative is very welcome, yeah? And it, it's, it's together with other uh, uh, reforms that the government is making. What we discussed about this morning is you have all these pieces of the puzzle, but they need to come together, yeah? So better IT, more open data, more, uh, more uh, uh, accountability within government, but between government and citizens. So all these reforms are reforms in the right direction, but they need to all work together. Just one reform like that won't make things happen. More is needed. One last question. Sir, what do you mean by, uh, you said recently that uh, if accountability works, it ensured the modernity of a country. How can you justify the, the relation of uh, if the accountability works because there's so many cases filed against for the alleged uh, corruption with some officials? What do you mean by accountability works towards the country's modernization? Thank you, sir. What I try to say that if you look at the size and if you look at the countries in the world that are doing well on this front, yeah, that really have accountable government that deliver services to the majority of the people, th these are these you could also call them modern societies. You know, typically um, um, countries like 
like Denmark, Germany, the Nordic countries, my own country, Holland, we're typically ranked as, as modern societies which have these accountabilities work very, very well. Yeah? And, uh, and if you dig into why this is working, you see that in those countries, those accountabilities all work. If I take my own country, yes, we have elections, but that's only part of the story. Yeah? We also have a state which is capable uh, whereby, you know, if, if the policy makers take the helm of the government and they send their instructions, that state is capable of executing them. And then there's a very direct relationship between citizens in Holland and the service providers. We're, we, Holland, we have a very strong culture whereby authority we do not respect. We just want practical things to be done. You know? So if there's a pothole or if the school isn't functioning as we, as, as we wish, we are able to express this and we have a government which reacts to it. Um, that whole, that's what I call a modern society, you know? So, and and you, can, you can classify countries like Denmark among that list. Now, on the way to that modern society, um, Francis Fukuyama called it getting to Denmark, another one of those countries. On the way, you need to fix those relationships, you know? You need to fix the capacity of the state, you need to make sure that they are accountable both to the voters and to the citizens as users of the services of the state. Thank you. Uh, we would like to acknowledge the presence of our budget under Secretary Richard Moya. Thank you for being, for, for being here, sir. Um, we just started the press conferences uh, with uh, Mr. Vandenbrink uh, sharing some of the highlights of this morning's um, sessions, particularly on the topic of transparency. So may we ask you to, uh, to also uh, give some of your insights and uh, what you think are some of the highlights of this morning's session right. and uh, perhaps a brief statement on uh, the Philippines' own efforts at uh, achieving transparency and open data and then we'll proceed with the question and answer portion. All right, first of all, uh, I apologize, I'm late. The session on fiscal transparency extended an hour. So it just finished, so we ran here. Uh, the session this morning, uh, the second session, I guess, in particular, uh, that I hosted was uh, a very energetic, very dynamic uh, session. The particular focus is on open data. There will be another session on the, the international open data uh, policy that's being crafted uh, that will be presented to countries to adopt. But this morning, we, uh, we as, as far as I recall, the first uh, discussion was on open data, the impact on society, uh, the the benefits. Uh, Rohir uh, talked about open data in the context of the whole world, who's doing what, who's not doing what. Uh, I think uh, Rohir mentioned that uh, with open data, uh, it allows us to uh, bypass the traditional cycle of uh, getting service delivered straight. It allows the, the, the constituents to directly demand from the suppliers other than having to go through the normal electoral process. I think that's one of the highlight of the discussion. Also, transparency is good, but transparency is not the end. Transparency is actually the means, uh, the, the, and the end is to provide measurable, tangible public service. So transparency in itself is not an end, and when people talk about transparency and we have published data, that's irrelevant. In fact, you cannot feel that. The real impact is when this data that has been uh, published actually provides meaningful, uh, measurable, palpable changes in society. On our end, uh, just to highlight, we do have an open data portal, uh, data.gov.ph. No? You'll be surprised to find out that all customs data the last month, including who, what, how much, who are the concessions, they're all published there in machine-readable format. What is a machine-readable format? It means you can get it, you can open it in Excel and do whatever you want to do with that. Of course, for the last several years, we have been publishing uh, budget data. Uh, not just in PDF form, but in forms that you can actually slice and dice. Uh, you can find that in uh, dbm.gov.ph. Uh, and uh, there are a host of other uh, uh, in, uh, initiatives that right now I just cannot recall. Okay, so uh, who wants to ask the next, qu the next question? Me, by the way, there is a copy of the uh, people's budget. For the last three years, the DBM has been publishing, Rohir, may I borrow? For the last three years, DBM has been publishing the people's budget. It's a, 
it's a non-technical presentation of the budget to the citizens. Whereas before, we have voluminous books of the budget that we send to Congress. We make that available to you, but sometimes that's too technical for, so we have been distributing this. This is the 2015 uh, people's budget. It tells you how much is going where, who's getting what, and what are the expected outcomes of the budget. I think it's available uh, uh, both in DBM, I think also in the APEC conference. Let me remind Bom what his government has done. <laughs> Uh, so, for instance, uh, the government's uh, procurement system, yeah. it has released 7 million records. Yeah? That's quite dramatic. Yeah? Uh, and this is uh, information relating to contracts, bidding, awards, and many of them you can also t tell where, where they are. So they are geotagged. You can use Google Earth. You can click on it, and from your desk, you can see whether this farm to market road is indeed where it should be and how it's being built. So, Phil, Phil Jeps is, yeah. is one of those systems. The other very um, uh, positive development is respect to the conditional cash transfer program. Remember, this is, a, this is a very transformative program because, as Bond said, it sort of makes it it makes it possible for government to directly reach the poor. And the, the government now, through this database that's at the heart of it, can identify the poor by name. And that program is a paragon of efficiency and transparency. That was the first time that the poor in the Philippines actually understood that their government knew that they existed, yeah? And that it was very empowering for them. And as they got to know about this program, they were asking questions and they were making comments, saying, why is this person on the list and not another person? The redress system that's built into this system in which citizens can give comments, either by phone, by SMS, by the internet, or by mail, it has dealt with the hundreds of thousands of these comments and questions. Uh, and that's a very transformative uh, type of program which is very important for the development of the country and which clearly in which open data has helped a tremendous deal. Incidentally, as you mentioned Phil Jeps, uh, we are happy to note that we're already in the final stages of piloting an online bidding uh, with DPWH. This implies that if you are a supplier here and there is a bidding in Metro Manila, you don't need to go to Metro Manila to join that bidding. You can uh, uh, participate in the bidding through philjeps.gov.ph. Uh, I think they're just pilot testing it in DPWH. If that works in DPWH, we will mainstream it across all the philjeps members. Just to make some clarification, Mr. Rogier, uh, you mentioned 7 million records released so far. This is since, since when? Since 2010. 2010. Okay. Who wants to ask the next, the next question? I'm seeing Mika raising his hands, okay. Good afternoon, uh, Mikael Flores of Business World. Uh, to you, Sekbon, just uh, follow up uh, dun sa online bidding. Sir, what's the timetable? When do you plan to roll it out? And then uh, how long will the pilot test with the PWH last? And what's the scope of the projects that will be included in the in the pilot testing of that online bidding and also what's the what's the procedure or what's the mechanics or what are the platforms that you're looking at in order to implement uh, the the plan uh, online system for bidding all right the first one on record they're supposed to uh, pilot uh, test uh, finish testing this june that's the record so i guess plus or minus a few weeks but on record i think the deadline is this June. Uh, the next question is, uh, will it be rolled out across all? Yes, but first we do it in DPWH. Uh, uh, how does that work? There are two, in many cases, there are two, two stages in the bidding. First is the eligibility documents that you need to submit. They decide that you're eligible, and then there's the financial that you transmit. This one, you preload all your eligibility document digitally online so that when you join a bidding, all your eligibility documents have already been verified and therefore that reduces the time. After that, you submit your bid. The bid, uh, when the bids and awards committee meet, they know that uh, they're flagged that there is an online bid. When they open the financial bid, they also open the bid submitted online. 
you cannot simply bid. You have to register. So there is a process of registering. There is a cost. The cost is, I think, 5,000 pesos per year. And that's simply so much lesser than the number of uh, photo, the, the cost it will take you to photocopy all your do documents in, in, in triplicate. So 5,000 pesos allows you to, per year, allows you to be notified if there are biddings related to you and participate. Why do we do phasing? Because uh, it's a reform. Sometimes there are legal impediments, sometimes there are technical impediments, sometimes there are cultural impediments. But the modality is through a browser, fieldjeps.gov.ph. Is that fair? Uh, if you don't have one in your house and you want to participate and you're qualified, I guess you just go to the nearest area where there is an internet, then it makes the whole process a bit more inclusive. Sure, I understand the, the system will be limited to those re to the contractors and suppliers mm -hmm. registered under FieldJets. Yes, but know. all the results are published. So if you're just uh, curious and you want to know who's been winning contracts, uh, there is a requirement. Before, the compliance was low uh, because uh, for many reasons. I will not venture some of those reasons now. Uh, but uh, we actually tied the, the, the compliance to the field jobs posting to their bonuses. So actually, many, uh, some departments or a handful of departments for the last previous years were not able to get their performance bonus and primarily because they have not published many of their bidding documents and the winning bids online. Sir, last question Sige pa. from me. Uh, how much time will it save uh, in terms of the time uh, a project is offered to potential bidders and it's as, actually awarded? Since as, as to the duration, that's prescribed by law. So what it actually saves, the, the time it saves is mostly the time of the bidder in going to and forth, I guess. No? Uh, in some particular instances, it say you don't have to be trapped in an elevator to participate in a bidding. Uh, but, uh, but, but the bidding cycle is prescribed by law. And sometimes, if you want to be democratic, you have to allow uh, motions for reconsideration, and then you have to give due process to that. So sometimes, it's really the inclusive process that actually extends the time. So you have to now balance the urgency versus uh, the transparency of the transaction. Thank you, sir. Any more questions from the floor? Okay. Para po kay USEC sa DBM po, sir, kinikilala natin na yung transparency and reforms ay mahalaga yan. Pero paano hindi maapektuhan ng ating pagsusulong ng transparency at mga reforma yung ating spending, di po ba medyo meron tayong concern dun sa ating underspending? Correct. So paano ba natin mapagsasalubong yung underspending tayo tapos may transparency tayo? Kasi may, in, in the common ground, parang may inaano na, na hindi nga tayo gumagastos kaya lang nagkakaroon ng epekto sa ating economic mm -hmm. growth, di ba? Paano ba natin pagkasalubongin yun? Yung transparency at the same time, we, we already pump prime the economy by spending, particularly on our infrastructure projects. Thank you, sir. Uh, yung transparency at yung economic spending, hindi siya mutually exclusive. In fact, the, the reason everyone knows we underspent is because we have not hidden that information. And everyone knows if you, and we also publish it, the reason there is uh, underspending primarily because of the huge chunk of budget that we need to spend on classrooms. And the reason why the classrooms are not being spent is because there is a prerequisite to identify suitable classrooms. You cannot just build wherever you want to build. You have to build it in a place where it is safe and it will last. So those are natural delays, uh, I guess, in the inefficiencies and or natural delays. In fact, uh, yesterday, there were two schools that they permanently closed because they found out because of open data, because they published the fault line, that they were on top of the fault line. I think that's the primary reason as far as government expenditure is concerned. GDP is not a primarily government activity. In fact, government is a con significant contributor, but not the biggest contributor. Private sector economic activity is. And if it's an indicator, I think PSA just uh, recently uh, released just a few hours ago data that we have actually reduced both unemployment and underemployment. So that if you think that as fact, then you deduce that perhaps there were more jobs and hopefully that would imply that more spending would come into the to the economy. So uh, uh, I understand that the expectation was 7% uh, GDP. In fact, I bet and I lost because I said we'll do 7.2 because Moody said we will do 
about that time. And we did 5.2. But let me also remind everyone that 5.2 is the fourth highest in the world. So it's not as if we're saying we're going down the drums. We're just saying we're not as fast as we want to. And in fact, that's good that we expect a lot from our government. But we should also recognize that 5.2 is higher than 90 plus percent of all other first quarter GDPs first. Second, you don't win championships on the first quarter. You win championships at the end of the year. So we hope and pray that the GDP will pick up and some of those will be captured. Uh, but, uh, but the transparency as a, as a tool of efficiency merely points out that A, government did not spend and therefore government should be made accountable, which we are doing now. And we knew that earlier because people knew that we have underspent. So that's, that's the beauty of transparency. It, it allows us to be held accountable for the things that we have proclaimed that we will do, for better or for worse. Any more questions from the floor? Okay, Mika. Uh, since the GDP numbers were already brought up, now may I just ask Mr. Vandenbrink if uh, if you are going to revise your projections for this year and the next, I understand the World Bank sees the economy growing at 6.5 this year and 6.3% uh, next year. Uh, with the lower than expected GDP growth in the first quarter, uh, what will be, uh, are you going to downwardly revise your targets and what's your outlook for government spending and the growth story of the country for the rest of the year? Thank you. Um, Mika, if I may, uh, let me intervene. Um, we are going to have another press conference on the World Bank's economic outlook on Thursday. So if it's okay, we'll, uh, we'll uh, take note of your question and Mr. Van den Brink will answer that on Thursday. Because tomorrow the World Bank will be releasing, I think, a, a global economic outlook report. So uh, we don't want to preempt that. So he can expound on the details of that report on Thursday. Okay. We'll long scoop. <laughs> but I just, I just want to echo what Bon is saying. So, you know, whether it's 7% or 6% or 5%, you're in the top league in the world, yeah? My own country, Holland, we, I don't think we've ever grown at 5%, yeah? So it, what matters a lot is how that growth uh, reaches the poor. And on that front, we've seen since 2013, we see d a definite change in the pattern of growth. So be before 2013, it was difficult to see how economic growth was reducing poverty. But since 2013, very reliable sources of data, household survey data, labor survey data, all show the same thing. Underemployment is going down, the incomes of the bottom 20-30% are growing faster than the rest of the country, yeah? poverty is going down. So if you, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you keep growing in this range, you know, say let's say the 5-6% range, and this sort of pattern in which this growth is reducing poverty remains, you can reduce poverty completely within a generation. That's, high, that's how high these growth rates are, and that's how, how the direction of this growth has been changing in the last years. Let me rephrase that uh, and, and, and uh, put it in, the ter in terms of uh, benefit to the people, because we have been growing. Uh, many of the question is that nakakain ba yung growth, no? I, I don't have data on nakakain, but I have data on health. Because we have improved our economy and therefore we have collected much more, and because we introduced uh, some uh, uh, efficiencies in the taxation and introduced the syntax, we have actually covered many of the poorest of the poor uh, with PhilHealth cards. Ano pong ibig sabihin nun? Uh, a substantial portion now of the PhilHealth card holders are poor people whose premium is now being paid by government. And where did government source that? Uh, number one, the syntax uh, taxes. Uh, number two, we are now paying significant part of, and this is part of the reason of the underspending. The second biggest part of underspending is that we actually paid uh, less interest than we ought to. So that's a virtuous underspending. That's not necessarily bad. Uh, and because we are now spending less on interest uh, uh, expenses, we're actually funneling many of those in uh, in in uh, 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 social spending like uh, field health, universal health coverage, particularly for the poor uh, and the poorest of the poor. Okay, uh, I think we can accommodate one to two more questions as our speakers uh, are in a rush to catch the start of the afternoon sure. sessions. Um, are there any more questions from the floor? Right. 
Enjoy. Sir, uh, John from DNA. Sir, aside from from the benefits that the that the economy gained from from having open data, how are the other governments? How are the other countries taking all this? Since this is being discussed in the in the forum, uh, open data is a new thing. I think we should put that in context. So not everyone is uh, in in there yet. In fact, we haven't even solved all the problems yet in open data. But I do know in Asia. Uh, uh, Korea and Taiwan are thinking of coming up with an open data group within Asia, or one of those groups that they requested uh, us. The leading countries in open data is UK, the US, and many developed countries, primarily because many of their operations are already digital. We're still in the transition of digitizing some of our government. In fact, that's a painful transition for many of us. Uh, I think I am, pardon me, I don't have the listing, but if you go to uh, Open Data Institute, they will have a listing of all countries uh, with open data initiatives in varying forms. Also, I think they have a report on open government countries that have open data, uh, uh, open data uh, projects. In our country, we were assessed, and the first assessment wasn't particularly uh, well, uh, in, in the barometer, but uh, we submitted to that barometer. I think they, was, they were assessed prior to some of the gains that we have had, and we're very confident that the next open data barometer, which ranks countries based on open data, we will, we will see a significant improvement. Okay, I will have to excuse you, Moya. You are being called to the afternoon yeah. session. Thank you, <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Yusek Moya. Um, and Mr. Roger, I will, ask <laughs> I will ask a closing statement from you, because... Uh, um, well, um, since uh, you are uh, seeing the global picture, um, what are some of the international best practices on open data so far? And uh, for your closing, uh, why is, uh, is it important for governments to pursue this? Yeah, so it used to be the case that it was difficult to publish data because it was costly, yeah? uh, and the technology wasn't there to do it. In, with the technological changes that have taken place, you know, open data, whether it's open data in government or for the private sector, or whether it's crowdsourcing, this opens up huge new opportunities. And I guess the fundamental uh, paradigm shift that, that we're seeing many countries make is, is strengthen these accountability relationships between individuals, citizens, and their governments. And uh, several of the APEC countries are leading the world on this. And in developing uh, and emerging East Asia, uh, uh, countries like Indonesia and the Philippines are, are really doing an excellent job. And that holds, that holds the promise that this increased open data will lead not just to better transparency, but to more accountability, which will result in better services for the majority of the people, including the poor. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Roger. Uh, th that ends our press conference for this afternoon. Uh, for this noon, uh, we will have another one at around 4.30 or 5 p.m., hopefully with the uh, IMF uh, resident representative, Shanaka Paris. See you later. Thank you.